um, and to be here. Okay, I want to talk about uh, motives and uh, some relations to representations. And let me first start with something else. I want to talk a little bit first about only Tate motives. So I define the following. This scheme we already have seen, P1 over the integers, removed three points. And I want to look at a motive on that guy. So I describe you what happens in the Hodge part. If set is a complex point of this space, then we can look at the following. So one, minus D, one of set, minus D, two of set, and then zero, two pi i, <coughs> two pi i log C. And zero zero two pi i squared, and that's a matrix which uh, describes the Hodge structure. So if you apply it to to rational vector, it will give you a local system. These functions are multi-valued functions on this on this complex space. Maybe you know them. This is a logarithm, and these are polylogarithms. For example, maybe I should write Lee K is locally around zero. It is given as such an expansion um, So you see if uh, K equals one, it gives you minus log brackets one minus set. In general, you have higher exponents, and of course, they are, if you look at them at one, you get famous values. Um, so, and I want to say it's a Hodge part. Of some m, which lives in dm of x. Okay, and it has to say rank one this m. Uh, three, sorry, <laughs> rank three, and it sits in short exact sequences. K of one, m set of zero. Um, this is a short exact sequence in a hard T structure on DMTX of Tate motives on X. So you can talk about short exact sequences. K is something which even lives on GM. It's the Kummer extension. It's also the universal extension with <laughs> invertible elements. You know, x1 of uh, set 0, comma set 1 is the, in it's the invertible elements. And on, Oost and on GM, you have a universal invertible element. And, that, and k1, uh, k is this extension. So it's an extension of this form. Right. And now we pull back M and long a so called tangential base point, one zero. So we have two punctures on, on C. And the tangential base point one zero points from one into the direction of zero. And you can pull back motives along such things. Yes. This guy is K of one. And this makes the yeah. M. So we pull back M. <coughs> and we can push forward it along a map from, uh, of course, you then pull back also 1, 0, upper star k of 1. And that's an extension between a set of 2 and set of 1. And there's a natural map. It splits this a natural map to set of 2. And uh, so if we pull back this along this tangential base point, we can push forward the resulting extension along this map to set of two and get an extension um, of the, yeah? Base point, base 
at one. I drew it here. That's zero and that's one. Yes. Okay. And uh, so we end up with an extension zero set to E set zero zero. Okay. And that's an interesting extension. It doesn't split. It is uh, even class of E in the respective motivical homology. So in H1 mod, of uh, set, or spec set, I, I omit spec, set of two, <laughs> it generates this motivic homology. And we all know this motivic homology is isomorphic to set mod 24 set. Yeah, this was an example. And that this goes back to Deline and also Bellinson. So it's related to the motivic polar logarithm. And you can do it with any even integer. You always can write down such a matrix. You can also do it with odd integers. But to get such finite cyclic groups, you have to do it with even integers. And make such an argument, then you end up with such a thing. OK. Now I want to go talk about a li little bit about rational Tate motives. So if the balance is only conjecture is satisfied for x, so x is now something different, then the category, then there's a heart of a T structure on the category of derived Tate motives on x, and the heart I denote by mt, and I look at geometric motives on x with q coefficients. And that's a Tanakian category. So of x should be made connected, something like that. Tenakian, so this goes back to the Levine. And uh, the corresponding motivic fundamental group of this Tenakian category is given as an extension of a pro-unit group, group scheme with just GM. So except for the pure Tate motives, Q of I, all motives, uh, yeah, are just extensions given by this Q of I. This is. So I think I yeah. You have but it's the same argument, I think, for. Yeah. Y yeah. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. So these are group schemes over, over Q. And you know its shape for, yeah. Unit shapes. A little bit. And in general, X is now no, no, no longer needs to satisfy BS. We do something else. Instead of the unipotent party as group scheme, we take an algebra object and some um, take modules over this algebra. So what you can do, you can look at representations of GM. So the GM thing stays the same. In this type case over the integers. And uh, this is nothing else but uh, D of set, I always mean the stable infinity category. And then to look at set graded objects of this guy, that's representation of GM. And there's a natural functor to D and T, the category of the full sub localizing subcategory of DM generated by the Tate object. D and T of X. So X only needs to be here quasi complete, quasi separated. That's all. And uh, in this, I denote the set shift sitting in degree n, outer degree n, I denote by set of n, of course. This also goes here to set of n. OK. And then if you want to model the Tate motives, you just look at, this, at the right adjoint of this left adjoint and apply it to the unit. And uh, look at modules over this guy inside this left-hand category, then you recover DMT x. <coughs> so this is the kind of result I'm after here. You want algebraic or representation theoretic descriptions of certain subcategories of certain motivic categories. 
And but if we are if we are here on motivic homotopy, I, I quickly state a result which also concerns our category SH. So th these are all these are all pretty formal results. Yeah. Yeah, but you look at an algebra object in here, and then it doesn't split. R of 1 is the algebra. It's a, the, the right eye joint is here, R. And you look at the right, and nothing, then it can be having extensions. Yes, modules over that thing. Yes. Yes. But the same thing you can play. So, Tate motifs correspond in the, in the SH picture to the cell, cellular objects. And they can be also described by a module category. In this case, the module, uh, the algebra is in C alg spectra to the <coughs> to the um, group-like E infinity space free on one point, which is Q S zero. So this replaces the set this Q S zero. Note it has connected component set, but it's a much more complicated space. But you need this space in case of this thing. So, but these are all pretty formal statements. I one more such statement, and then I will come to something more algebraic. Okay. <coughs> if you only want to talk about dualizable objects, <coughs> you can also do the following. Dualizable. So there's a free infinity category on one dualizable object. In this case, I mean infinity one category. There is also for. But uh, these are the Bordism categories. And uh, in this case, we have an algebra C, say, in, 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 S, in C alg um, SP to this bordism category. I mean, here always the functor category. I mean, this was an infinity group of it, this QS0. But now it's a really a category here, board symmetric moving category. You put in the day convolution symmetric moving structure, and you get an algebra object in there. What's the That's what Lurie, for example, proved that bordis the bordism categories, these are manifolds with, yeah, goes oh, down to zero oh, dimensional oh, manifolds. Yeah. These bordism categories, yeah. Lurie, okay. Which by Lurie, yes, exactly. What does that have to do with? Yeah, E is dualizable, so we have a unique functor from board to SH, SHX, which sends the f element, which is the image of the free element of the point, so they say 2E. Oh. And this, uh, then we construct just a functor then in the same way, and we take, get, apply the right adjoint, and then we get an algebra. Oh. Okay. That's how it works. And you can do it with a bunch of dualizable objects. It's an arbitrary set of dualizable objects. Then you have, uh, yeah, you can do the same. But this is all pretty formal. Um, now I want to state the theorem, which may, yeah? Yes. Think generated by E inside that. Oh. Under duals so and tensor products, yeah, yeah. everything is like that, yes. And, and triangle. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. So stable, it will be stable, yes. So the following makes the situation more algebraic. <coughs> so I have to put some words. See, k-linear, symmetric, monoidal, stable, presentable, k 
category. So the usual thing you look at, except it's also k-linear, an Excel object in C, and uh, some number with a property that um, the d exterior power, uh, no, I should write it, lambda dx. So because you're rational, because k is characteristic zero, you can form by a projection operator, you can project out, out of x tensor d an exterior power. This exists somehow uniquely. Lambda dx, and this should be tensor invertible. And the next one, lambda d plus 1 x, should be 0. OK. Um, then we get a functor essentially unique. Oh, it is essentially unique left adjoint, symmetric monoidal from the representation category, which you can introduce by. Yeah, you look at all representations of this group, GLDK. Also, infinite dimensionals and take complexes and take the drives category. This is easy in this case. In other cases, it will be more complicated to define this category. So there exists an essentially unique functor to C, which sends here the standard representation in degree 0 to our object x. Okay. So this, and yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You need yes, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. Symmetric monoidal. Yes. So we can apply it, of course. In motives, for example, if you have an abelian scheme, we want to look at such objects whose these exterior power is 0. But these are given by one motives of abelian schemes, such objects. So the motive of A, rationally, split as a direct sum i equals 0 to 2g. I call them h of i, h i of a, and this lies in DMS q. And uh, yeah, so h i is in general given then by the, x, the tensor power of h1, symmetric tensor power, sorry, sum i h1 f of a. You take the symmetric because somehow h1 lives in degree 1. So if you take the 2g plus first one of this guy, it will vanish. So, But then, if you shift it down once, you have such an object here. So you get d rep gl 2g, comma q, mapping to dms q. And the standard representation here goes to H1A shift minus 1. Yeah. Um, and then you can play the same game. I don't write it down. You look at the right edge joint. You apply it to the tensor unit. You look at modules over this. And you get a full embedding. Um, and that is, this is why. Ivadari proved this theorem. He wanted to model certain subcategories of multiple categories. 
So this goes then back to Ivanari. <laughs> it sits in homological degree one, the H1A. Oh, homological. homological, yes. And now, and Kao did also some work on that in the case G equals one. <coughs> and now I want to do such things, not only for GM, but more for general proof schemes, integrally. And this will take place in the ethal motivic category, so DA8 of S. And that's defined to be now a definer motivic category, the P1 stabilization. of the A1 localization of the derived category of sh ital sheaves on smooth schemes over S. Okay, that's the usual definition. This goes back to Ayub. And also, Chisinski de Glees did work on ethyl motifs. Um, <coughs> and from now on, I want to assume S Noetherian, just technical condition, finite dimensional, and excellent, that some theorem of Ayub will be true, which I use later. Um, Um, an example of a, of a motive in there, I want to look at a list one motive. So that's M. A one motive is something like a semi abelian scheme G over S, equipped with a map from a lattice, viewed as a smooth, not a finite type group scheme to G. That's a one motive. And I write down the one motive. And M star, there's always a dual one motive. It exchanges the torus and the lattice and takes a dual abelian variety. And I denote by C of M if I look at the sheaves represented by these in the ital topology on smooth schemes. So this I denote then by L underline to G underline. By a two-term complex, exactly, yeah. And that's a degree, yeah. And then we have a pairing. Uh, this, these are constructed, for example, by, yeah, yeah, you can construct a pairing naturally in the derived category. The GM underline shift minus one. Um, in the derived category just of sheaves on smooth schemes, sheaves, smooth schemes, S8, yeah. And this pairing will turn out, if you twist it and shift it correctly, that the images of CM in the, in the DA8 are in fact dualizable. And uh, Okay, they are dualizable. Um, I call A C of M shift minus one the image in DA8. S set. Okay. Now I want to model something generated by this one motive integrally, in an integral way. So I have to say now what rep GLR set is. D rep. R is the rank of the one motive. It's the sum of the dimension of G plus the rank of the lattice. 
So, and by this, I mean the incoherent sheaves on the stack. Yes, I just defined what incoherent means. I have some time, hopefully. Um, if X is an arbitrary stack, then DQC, the quasi coherent chiefs on X or modules of, or X modules with quasi coherent cohomology or something like that. But you can define them as the limit of all spec A mapping to X DA. That's one possible definition. <laughs> and then if X is an Ethereum, we also have the bounded coherent ones. Um, DB coherent of X. That's the full subcategory. Of course, everything is here stable, infinity category. And the incoherent chiefs are nothing else but the incompletion of that guy. So they differ from this DQC in general, of course. Uh, <coughs> And then we have the following result in the same vein as, as the previous results, but integrally. Um, we have a symmetric modal functor. In this case, I don't know if it's unique. Symmetric modal left adjoint from D wrap GLR. C to D A eight S set. Of course, such that <coughs> um, the standard representation is sent to this object A, which was given by this two term complex. And then we can play the same game. Maybe I'll write it down once more. But not, yeah. So rationally, this functor would exist by Ivanaris theorem. The whole main part is that it also exists integrally. <coughs> so if we define A to be R of 1, R of the right adjoint, <coughs> then in general we have a full inclusion of the compact objects uh, in mo the module category into DA8. As said, <coughs> and that's because the tensor unit might not be compact in DA8 set. But if it's compact, then we have a complete full inclusion. One, yeah. <laughs> so you know, in the tile categories, need not be compli compactly generated. So and uh, you need here because that's compactly generated. For the argument for this, you need compactly generated. Uh, <coughs> yeah, then it would be compact, exactly. No, no, I, this I don't know. Right, 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 right. What a DA8 has set. OK, a small list of ingredients which for the proof of this. So first of all, we use the rigidity theorem of Yushul Zeff. Which means that if we look at finite coefficients, Z 
that, but p to the n, then it boils down to the derived category of sheaves on the small etale side of S with one with P inverted. One over P etale set mod P to the N. So that's a drastic little uh, simplification, drastic simplification. <coughs> uh, yeah, that's a very interesting, nice theorem of Joseph. And uh, by this equivalence, we can look at the image of A in here. So because that's just a derived category of an abelian category, this has a natural t-structure. And the image of A in here lies in the heart. So A image A lies in the heart of this category. And uh, then we can produce um, from representations of GLR elements also in the heart. But why can we do that? That's the reason that's the next ingredient here, namely DREP of GL. Uh, set. You can explicitly model it by some, you take the bounded derived category, or first you take some, some k instead of d, but at the end you take here d, b of representations. That's now an additive category only. So you took a representations on finitely generated projective modules over the integers. I write projective because I also do it over some general lambda. But of course, it minus means over the integers finally generated free. Maybe, yeah. Um, representations of GLRC. <coughs> so you just take a finitely generated free abelian group, take a representation of GLR on it, and then you can easily produce an object by twisting with some torsor in the heart here of this category, and you can take it back via the right adjoint. You do this for every n, and then you take the limit, and then you get the p completion of the object you're interested in. And then you prolong it to complexes. So uh, now I wrote this, and there are some infinite things. So yes. <coughs> That's one ingredient. And then we have the p-completed parts, and the rational part is given by Ivanari's theorem. So we need an arithmetic square, finally, for some functors. <coughs> two glue with two parts. And that's how it goes. Yeah, no, no, this is, this is the D DVQC, of course. Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, every particular object, yeah. To prolong it to the in category is not a problem anymore, so to say. But you do it first for the complexes, <coughs> and then, yeah. Yeah. I forgot to switch off my phone. Sorry. <laughs> Beeped. Yeah. OK. Um, these are the three ingredients I wanted to mention. Uh, <coughs> so this applies in particular to just a one motif, in particular to an abelian, an abelian scheme. And, uh, but as you know, um, for the motivic fundamental group of an abelian scheme, you expect something else. If it is a generic abelian scheme or abelian variety or a field, you expect something like the general symplectic group as motivic Galois group. And this is what I want to look at next. So first I define some groups for you. So I define the orthogonal group only over Q. So I define it for some ring. 
it's just the matrices A with the property A transpose A is equal to the identity matrix. <coughs> but what will become important is that this is also the, the fixed points of some C2 action. So GL2, C, GL, D of R, sorry, C2, fixed points for some C2 action. And the C2 action sends the canonical element tau in C2 sends A to A transpose inverse, of course. Yeah, this three. <coughs> and I define for the arbitrary commutative ring the symplectic group SP2G of R to be all um, A in G and 2G of R with the property A transpose J. So it, it respects a form, a symplectic form. And the form I chose is the following J equals 0 EG minus EG 0. <coughs> and this is then also given as the fixed points of some G2 action. Namely, tau acts as follows. A goes to, no, I don't know if I can just completely directly could imagine it, but the formula is minus J A transpose inverse J. And the last uh, group scheme is S G S P two G of R. These are given as A in G L two G of R with the property again. <coughs> we want that the form is somehow preserved, but only up to a scalar, an invertible scalar. So A transpose J. A equals lambda j for lambda an invertible element in R. And uh, right, <coughs> after introducing these group schemes, I want to see if they have some universal properties, at least rationally. So I work now again rationally. Um, and I take a C as in Ivanaris theorem. <coughs> and we can look at the dualizable objects inside of C. They are category with duality. Um, so we have a duality acting on CD. And I have two versions of, duali of dualities here, which I want to consider. Namely, a duality is in particular a double dual self-identification meaning a map from some object y to y double dual. And that's natural. If you have a symmetrical dual structure and the dualized object, you get such an equivalence. But I can twist it by minus 1. So I look at the two dualities, either plus 1, the usual map, or twisted with minus 1, some, some duality which, which gives you then uh, anti-symmetric or symplectic forms, so to say. Um, 
And I look at the following, C wedge D, the wedge finite objects inside of the core group grid of C D. These are the objects which are important for Ivanari's theorem. Um, so these are the objects X with a lambda dx is intense invertible and lambda d plus 1x is 0. So a duality gives rise to a C2 action on the core group of it, and uh, <coughs> a C2 action then on this uh, on this C wedge D. Mm. And uh, Ivanari's theorem that gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence between functors from this representation category to the C wedge D. So because this has a C2 action, the category we are looking at, which is the universal category, also acquires a C2 action. So we get a C2 action on a D wrap GL DK. And as an object of C alch, say, I mean, we have to, have to look at a K linear presentable category. So these are modules over the module category over K in pre presentable categories. Okay, these are just the K linear presentable categories. And now we have the C2 action. Of course, on GLD, we also have C the C2 action, even two. And these correspond. This is the first part, this thing I want to say without proof. If you chose the plus one action, then the action is given by the, this action on GLD, which we already know. And if the duality is given by minus one, it's induced by A maps to this other action. We have to make some compatibility here. And now <coughs> we see that a functor from the homotopy quotient in this category, in this category of our representation category, so D rep GLDK mod out by H mod out by C2. Yeah, as a presentable symmetric model K linear infinity categories, stable and so on and so on. Uh, then tensor functors to C to our target category are in one to one correspondence with object X in C wedge D H C2, six six points. Yeah, we home out of something, we have to take the quotient. And on meshing spaces, it gives you the fixed point. <laughs> so this category says satisfies such a universal property here. And such objects are, of course, um, commission objects, so like forms. Yeah, yeah. The standard representation will be mapped to this x. So underlying it will be Ivanaris theorem if you compose it with the factor from D rep to DK. But this is, of course, a completely different category. And we'll see which category it is. Of course, you might have some. Ah, I write it down now ne as next. So we have the pro following proposition. And this is in joint ongoing work with Heine. Um, that, if you have the plus one duality, then D wrap G at R D at is nothing else but D rep O D. Okay. Okay, and if you have a minus one 
duality. So uh, this is really ongoing work. Yeah. So we have the DREP of GL here. The, 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 so to say this exterior dimension must be even if we have a non-trivial object in this category. So we have 2G here. Okay. HC2 is given as DREP. Symplectic group. 2G, comma K. <coughs> yeah, and this I want to sketch a little bit. Um, okay. So we work in derived stacks. We have to work in derived stacks. So D of is so animated rings, so simplicial commutative rings, modulo quasi weak equivalences, and then op of this So that's the usual category for derived algebraic geometry. And stacks are nothing else but objects of etal sheaves <coughs> on these schemes. So sheaves etal. And I want to look them only over k. So I take the slice category over spec k. Yes, sheaves and spaces. And uh, usual stack gives rise to a derived stack, so there's an inclusion. And this I denote, the image I also denote by BGL dk. So now the first statement <coughs> is that on, the, on this X C2, on this stack, when we take the homotopy fixed points, we end up with the derived stack B, G, L, D, K, C2, where here this fixed point are really uh, taken in schemes, so our usual schemes, O, D, or SP2G, but here something more happens. You take the fixed points in the world of derived stacks. So you have to, this is some statement, and uh, now we have now we can work with so to say this category on, here on the left or this stack, I mean, and we should look at the following map QC on BGLDK. Then HC2, there's a natural map to um, QC of this fixed point stack. HC2. QC is quasi coherent sheaves. I have a slightly different notation now for it, <laughs> for some reason. I'm sorry? Yes. Now it's this. I don't know why, because maybe some different. So yeah. yeah. So, <coughs> and the claim is it's an equivalence. This map. So note, we take a limit inside here, so it makes takes the the commutation a limit goes to a co-limit in certain categories for a certain functor. And the functor is QC. So we, fir so we first, there are two steps to show it's an equivalence. First is that the co-limit over RPN, so, the so C2 is limit over RP infinity. We first take the co-limit over RPN of the QC, BGL, DK, and this maps to the QC of the limit over RPN of BGLDK 
Yeah, and this is an equivalence. We want to show first this. And there's the statement. Yeah? Yeah, on, now it's a functor on derived stacks. RPN is a space, and it's an indexing category. You have a functor from RPN to oh, <laughs> where the category where, where this QC lives. So these are symmetric monoidal, stable, k-linear, presentable, infinity categories. And you have a functor from RPN to this category, and the co-limit over this functor. This this notation means. Yes. No, I don't. If you have an arbitrary category, say yeah. I, yeah. you have a functor. Uh, you have a functor here to the category of C alge, say in pro L, just for simplification. You can take the co-limit over this diagram. Yeah, and now I is RPN as an infinity group of eat. The functor is yeah. The functor, the functorality, is given on the Qs because B G L D K has a C2 action, meaning there's a natural map from BC2 to stacks. The image of the point in BC2 is BGLDK. Ah, okay. and, and then I take RPN inside here and restrict it. Yeah. Okay, so and the point is that QC from so-called perfect stacks oh, okay. to this target category, I write it down maybe even if I don't have time, C alt per L, it's the same category as I wrote down previously but in a different, slightly different notation, mod K under, op. So this preserves finite limits. And that's a result of uh, Bensvi, Nadler, uh, Francis, and also Gatesbury, and also Lurie in this FHG. Okay, so we know, because F all these decks are perfect because they are in characteristic zero, we, we know this first statement. <sighs> How much time is left? Uh, oh, really? That's good, okay. Yeah, then, uh, I can make some uh, some examples how this looks like these limits. It's not really necessary in, uh, needed, but I make these examples because it gives some intuition for the second step. N equals one, so R P one S one. I denote X as B G L D K. And I'm interested in the limit over S one of X. And of course, it's not nothing but taking uh, fixed points with respect to some set action, integer action. And this can be modeled as the following. A set x on x, and we take here the diagonal, so x times x. And here we take the map it, comma, the canonical action of the element of C2, x, comma, tau to x times x, and we take the pullback here. <coughs> So you so you can compute the limit like this over S1. Then for n equals two, we have the following. We take the pullback. Yeah, we have to go through the skeletal filtration of RP2, so to say. So that's we have an attaching map S1 to H1 of degree two. And uh, 
So the corresponding is also, everything is contravariant here, so because the corresponding diagram of stacks looks like follows. Here the limb over S1, which we just, just described of X, going to the limit over S1 of X, plus, but this time with trivial action, because we have the degree 2 map from S1 to S1. So this, that's just the loop stack of X, LX. The co-tensor of X with S1. And here we have a natural map of X again to this. And we can take here the pullback. And that's for n equals 2. And make one more step. So for n equals 3, we have uh, um, yeah, the limit over RP2 of X mapping to the cotensor of X with S2 because we are attaching an S2. And here we have X, and then we have here the pullback. That's the limit over RP3, and it goes on like that. Okay, so we always have here a tower will, will appear here, and uh, it will only always be pullbacks from maps from x to some x to the Sn. And that's the relevance for, this, for the second step. So the second step says that um, the co-limit over n over qc of the limits over rpn dgl dk is nothing else but qc of the limit over RP infinity PGL DK. So here we have our space we are interested in, the fixed points, BGL upper HC2. And here we have the quasi coherent sheaves, uh, a co-limit of quasi coherent sheaves, which will be then the other side of the theorem which we want to prove. And here the relevance is that all these maps X maps to X to the SN for N greater or equal than 2 are affine. So you just need to know that if you have a co-limit of algebras over a stack and take QC of this co-limit, it's the co-limit of the QCs on the, of the individual algebras. And that's somehow known. So that's the second step. And this um, finishes the sketch. And then we can apply, of course, we do the same as we did in Ivanari's case and get some representation theorem for the general. Ah, sorry. Yeah, do I have time? So for the general symplectic groups, there's also a proposition. D rep. Maybe I skip the proof. GSP2G set to C corresponds now <coughs> to an x in c wedge d and an object k in c wedge 1 together with a pairing now x tends to k, not only not anymore to the unit object, which is anti-symmetric, non-degenerate. OK, I skipped the proof of this result. And this we need for an abelian scheme. So an example is an abelian scheme, um, A over S. Then we get a functor from D rep, GSP to G over the integers. So this result I just sketched here was to, to get it for the rationals. But we can do the same gluing procedure to get it over the integers to DA8 S set. <laughs> so maybe I need one more backward and then it's done. OK. Yeah, and of course, you can play the same game. You take the unit object here, take the right end joint of it, look at modules over this algebra here, and you get a full embedding. So this models in an integral way such abelian schemes, the one motives of abelian schemes. An example, last example, 
is you can take the modular stack H E. Ah, sorry. It should have a symmetric self-duality, of course. It should be some, somehow principally polarized because we want to have we we want to have a duality. I forgot about that. Sorry, self-duality. Yeah, then we get this. And H E is the modular stack over spec modular stack over spec C for principally polarized polarized abelian schemes. And we can look at DA8 of this guy and we get a canonical functor. Okay, the last remark is I want to make some connection to Ayub's Mutivik Galwa group. So he looks at DA8 K for K embeddable into the complex numbers with some, for example, the set coefficients. It produces a so-called motivic Hopf algebra in a highly structured homotopical way. And the forgetful the Betty realization functor factors through co-modules over this motivic Hopf algebra. So, so to say the, the representation category of H. And we, if you have now an object here, we have a canonical map of D rep GL D set into this category. So we have such a composition from a representation category to a representation category. And it's natural to expect that this group scheme maps then to this, this group scheme, which induces this functor. And this is not completely worked out, but that would be interesting. OK, I think here I want to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Are you. there some questions?